Right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's resume the hearing. Dr. Konga, please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We now come to FET in due process. Well, there has not been a denial of justice in this case or any other violation of due process, and certainly there has not been a violation of due process in relation to the 13th Amendment. The claimants argued this morning, and I refer to slide 92 of claimants' presentation, that Germany made not an informed decision. The opposite is true. Not required by the normal legal process for passing a law, it employed two commissions to assist it in ascertaining the facts and to weigh the result that Fukushima, that, uh, the, the shift that Fukushima meant. Now, Vattenfall had complained that the Ethics Commission did not include any energy experts. Well, it included the former CEO of BASF-SE, who was one of the signatories of the so-called Energiepolitische Appell, energy, uh, energy Policy Appeal of August 2010. That was a major lobbying campaign initiated by energy companies prior to the lifetime extension, which argued that Germany could not dispense with lignite and nuclear energy. So. Apparently, in Vattenfall's eyes, this man is not an expert on electricity and not on nuclear energy. Further, a member also of the Ethic Commissions was the president of the IG Bergbau Chemie and Energie, a major trade union in the energy sector. And the person was also, at the same time, a vice chairman of the supervisory board of Steag GmbH, Germany's fifth largest energy company. Moreover, had the claimants had any doubts as to the Ethics Commission, Germany provided a witness statement from Professor Schreuers. Had they wanted to hear her, they could have summoned her. They didn't. They also argue they were not heard. Well, in the hearing, the public hearing, a voluntary hearing, not required by the legal process, there was E.ON, an E.ON representative that was heard. E.ON, the sixth claimant in this arbitration, shareholder in all three of the plants at issue. Well, if the co-owner of the plants, that is, if claimants get what they want, would receive 1.8 billion plus interest in this arbitration, is not assisting in protecting Vattenfall's rights, then what? Also, Vattenfall say they wrote a letter, and they said it this morning, a letter to the German government on 17 June 2011, C30, that was before the adoption of the 13th Amendment. This letter was received and read, meaning Vattenfall's arguments had been available to the legislator. The letter had been received and read. Nowhere do they claim that that's not enough to be heard. Again, one other expert that was heard in the voluntary public hearing was an industry association of which Vattenfall is a member. And outside this arbitration, they have said that our, uh, association safeguards their right. And this person was also in the public hearing. Let me go back to the E.ON representative. We actually introduced a quote from this person into the record, SR143 at page 14. The E.ON representative stated, quote, all arguments regarding safety technology, the energy industry, economic policies and ethics, which are necessary for a rational weighing, weighting of the situation have been put on the table. That's E.ON saying that. Now, Vattenfall maintains that Germany did not make an informed decision. Apparently, E.ON disagrees. Claimants have tried to make into a separate claim that the ECT provides for a stable legal framework. Well, Article 10.1 of the ECT is not a stabilization clause. 
it does not freeze the regulatory um, regime. But also that, I mean, the allegations Vattenfall made regarding the regulatory environment were wrong. We've talked at length about Kalka of 1978. The 13th Amendment reflected a return to the 2002 phase-out law, only supplemented by the fixed shutdown dates and the removal of the NEPV. The 2002 nuclear phase-out law always contemplated the transfer um, and selling of OEPVs, which was maintained in the 13th Amendment. And in determining the end dates for the individual plans, the legislator calculated in such a way that the OEPVs could be eaten up and everybody's OEPVs could be used either by producing themselves or by selling and transferring them. Plus, it applied a safety margin. <coughs> Indeed, I've shown you the slide before from the constitutional complaint of of Vene and KKK, Vattenfall's own counsel and the constitutional court proceedings confirmed that it returned, the 13th Amendment returned to the 2002 phase out, supplemented only by an additional, um, um, additional element, i.e. the fixed end dates. There was no violation of FET. There was also no expropriation. The threshold for any expropriation is that there has been a taking. If there was no taking, the discussion about police powers, about the public interest becomes moot. No taking, no expropriation, no need to discuss the theories. Vattenfall claimed that the 13th Amendment directly expropriated the NEPVs and Criminal's license for commercial electricity production. <coughs> However, those are not investments for the purposes of the ECT. They're not protected property rights under German law and not under international law. They cannot be subject, separate subjects of expropriation. With regard to German constitutional law, Professor Papier, the former president of the Constitutional Court, has submitted a legal opinion, and I commend this opinion to you, and also he will be available next year, next week for your questioning, so you can ask him to your heart's content. And he says there, and I quote, the electricity production volumes are not independent, economically valuable legal positions that are protected as property under German constitutional law. Vattenfall also claim that the 13th Amendment somehow indirectly expropriated them. However, like the NEPVs, the OEPVs are neither investments made by claimants, nor are they protected property rights under general international law or German constitutional law. They are not capable of being taken separately. Also, Claimants failed to show that a taking has cons uh, occurred because a taking for an indirect expropriation requires a substantial deprivation of investment, of the investment. Let's look at what claimant's counsel, Mr. Hubsch, writes himself. He writes, most tribunals seem to agree that expropriation can only occur where diminution in value is very close to 100%. This is RL 54, 100%. The Energy Charter Secretariat, on which claimants rely, that's exhibit CLA 2, they say the awards indicate that at least a substantial loss of control or value and end value or severe economic impact is required. Let's look at other authorities. Corn products in Mexican states uses destroying, sterile housing, useless, 
so useless that they must be deemed to have been expropriated. Tecmet, neutralized or destroyed. Sempra, virtually annihilated. Electrabel, the requirement under international law for the investor to establish the substantial, radical, severe, devastating, or fundamental deprivation of rights or the virtual annihilation, effective neutralization, or factual destruction of its investment, its value, or enjoyment. Archer, substantial and deprives the investor of all or most of the benefits of the investment. What was Vattenfall's investment? It was in a energy company that happened to have interest at the time in four at the um, nuclear power plants, one of which it shut down ir completely irrespective of the measures at issue in this arbitration. It w its investment was and is one in a large energy provider. And as I said, if you regulate one way of production of energy, this will have repercussions on all of the other production means. Therefore, in order to show an impact, to show a taking, they need to show the effect on their portfolio as part of their burden of proof of making the case. We have, a, we've warned them from the beginning of this arbitration that they've not done so. And now, at the time of the oral hearing, they have not done so either. They've failed to show the portfolio effect. Indeed, Germany was very vocal about the portfolio effect and Vattenfall's duty to substantiate its claim long before the Philip Morris Award was rendered. But the tribunal in Philip Morris in Uruguay agrees with respondent. It says in paragraph 283, Abel's business is to be considered as a whole since the measure affected its activities in their entirety. Later on, across its entire portfolio. This was also the case with Vattenfall because of the merit order. In 284, the effects of the SPR were far from depriving Abal of the value of its business or even causing a substantial deprivation of the value, use or enjoyment of the claimant's investments according to the standard that has been adopted for a measure to be considered expropriatory. I've shown you the OEPVs can be used in other plants. They contain value. Plus, Vattenfall has a very large non-nuclear portfolio. And because of the merit order, they were affected by the measures and will have profited from them. In Chemtura, in paragraph 263, the tribunal held that the sales from Lindane products were a relatively small part of the overall sales of Trentura at Canada at all relevant times. Under these circumstances, the interference with the uh, of the respondent with the claimant's investment cannot be deemed substantial. Vattenfall would have had to demonstrate a complete destruction or virtual annihilation of its overall investment, but it has failed to submit any concrete evidence that it has suffered any adverse financial impact as a result of the 13th Amendment. To the contrary, respondent has shown that not even if you just focus on the nuclear part of the activities, they were negatively affected. But more important is the portfolio effect, and we've both seen it in Philip Morris and Chemtura, that is a significant and relevant factor. So we have looked at Vattenfall's portfolio in Germany. And bear in mind in Chemtura, the tribunal said, the sale from Lindane products were a relatively small part of the overall sales of Chemtura Canada. We looked at Vattenfall's 2010 report. This is LH117. And we looked at the numbers for Germany. It's bigger and more blown up on slide 129. And this is the annual report for 2010. 
so one year before Fukushima, and we couldn't find nuclear. And then we figured out that we couldn't find nuclear because Brunsbüttel and Krimmel weren't running. So in order to determine what small part of Vattenfall's investment was affected by the 30th Amendment, and we looked further back and found the 2007 annual report, which has indeed a number for nuclear, because at that time, Krummel had to be, uh, happened to be running for a change. And if you look at that slide, it's very clear that the nuclear production of Vattenfall, Germany, Vattenfall, Germany, is just 3%. 92% came from conventional power sources. Remember what I told you about the socket and the electricity, and that if I regulate one way of production, it has through the merit order an impact on all of the others. So 92% of Vattenfall's production stood to benefit from price increases due to the taking off the grid of Krummel and Brunsbüttel. Vattenfall have refused to provide any information. The conclusion is that there was no financial impact, no taking, no expropriation. And obviously, there was also no violation of the right of constant protection and security. Three years into this arbitration, it's still unclear what Vattenfall is trying to claim under this heading. Um, this slide has taken quotes out of our uh, respondents' observation to certain tribunal questions, which was six weeks before the hearing. Uh, now we are at the hearing, and it is still unclear. Claimants have neither alleged that respondent or third party physically harmed them or in their investment, nor have they even alleged that respondent failed to provide a legal framework enabling to uh, them to protect their investments, or that they have been denied recourse to the German judicial system. As you know, the claims are pending, and Vattenfall's counsel in the Constitutional Court proceedings is present here today. Let's look at the umbrella clause. An umbrella clause claim cannot exist if there's no agreement to be umbrellaed in, no obligation, no binding obligation. The president of the, former president of the Constitutional Court, Professor Papier, explains in his Atom Consent's opinion, and I quote, one must conclude in line with a greatly prevailing view in legal literature that the decisions of the Federal Constitutional Court that the atom consensus has, consensus has no legal impact. It is clear when looked at, at as a whole that there's nothing that affirms and everything that negates the existence of an intention to be legally bound. Instead, the parties all understood that it was a gentleman's agreement. That's also confirmed by the Constitutional Court decision on the annex to the atom consents, and I'll come to that in a moment. Indeed, it would have been impossible for Germany to conclude a binding agreement, a binding contract with the content of the atom consents, binding the legislator or the government to enact or refrain from enacting a certain law. Stabilization agreements are not permissible under constitutional law because Germany is a parliamentary de democracy. The government cannot bind parliament, full stop. Parliament can't even <coughs> bind a subsequent parliament other than in the area of treaty. The government in power cannot bind a future government. It's impossible because that would negate elections and therefore the government doesn't do that. And oh, sorry. That's not quite the same as the, the question whether a third party is entitled to rely upon a statement of intent made by the government. And it may not preclude 
subsequent government or subsequent legislature are changing uh, that pattern of behavior that may, may it not create a legally binding situation in the same way that it did in nuclear tests? You mean the nuclear test case? The nuclear test case was, first of all, we were dealing with a unilateral decision, a uh, unilateral um, declaration from one state to another state. That is a declaration on a different level. Nobody disputes that states as states can bind them and take obligations vis-a-vis -vis other states, whether through unilateral declarations, which are very rare and for which there are very high standards to assume that an intent to be bound exists. And there's treaties in which, uh, in which states bind themselves. But there's a difference. There's a difference if you climb down from the level of international law into the normal domestic contest. And if there you are entering into negotiations or discussions and the counterparty knows that nothing coming out of that can be binding, there's no, first of all, there's no umbrella clause, but I don't think you're talking about an umbrella clause claim, but more, uh, he, uh, Professor Lowe, I understood you to go rather into FET rather than umbrella here. Let me put it another way. And in order to create legitimate expectations, does there have to be an agreement, a binding agreement, or can there be legitimate expectations on the back of something that is not a legally binding agreement? So you are on FET rather than umbrella clause? I'm not tying it down to <laughs> okay, good. provision. I'm just, just asking the question whether you need to have a legally binding agreement in order to create legitimate expectations that an investor can rely on. You have to differentiate between two things. You can have legitimate expectations that do not require a contract. Legitimate expectations can arise, for example, from a law. Say you have the, uh, the Spanish laws on renewable energy that contained a promise for a fixed term in time that a certain tariff would be granted. I disagree with Sharan that such a specific comment for a specific regulatory regime to be enjoyed over a period of time does not create a legitimate expectation. I think it does. But that is not what happened here. You had a informal um, understanding that if the German legislator enacted something like the 2002 phase-out law, the energy companies would not take this law to the constitutional court and shut it down. So it was, it was more an agreement to protect the state to find out what is, if I do this, will you take me to the constitutional court to shoot down that law? So if I do this, what we have just discussed, you will not go and challenge it. That was what was actually behind the uh, so-called atom consensus. It was tr a, a way to protect the 2002 phase-out law. It, didn't, it wasn't creating legitimate expectations going forward for the energy companies. It marked the, the, the shift between unlimited power production licenses to phase out limited in time. I don't know if I've answered your, uh, your question, um, but uh, expectations are not only created by contracts, they can also be created by other state instruments such as laws and a general promise made in a law to the public rather than an in individu individualized agreement with a concrete investor. Thank you. Now going back to the atom consensus, at a time Mr. Hennhofer was participating on the behalf of the energy companies and he, so that is somebody who at the time was acting for the energy companies, explained in 2002 that 
they had not intended an impermissible binding effect on the legislator. So one of the negotiators for the energy company said no binding effect intended. That is pretty clear. Y you will remember slide 22 of Vattenfall's presentation this morning, and they were trying um, to establish that Germany quoted only a part of the Constitutional Court decision on Biblis. Um, let me show you what Eon said. Eon in the Constitutional Court proceedings represented by Gleis Lutz. Eon uses exactly the same quote that Germany used I with regard to the atom consents. And it says, its significance is low, it's characteristic of commonly found political statements on which no responsible person of sound mind would hang its hat. Eon quoted exactly the same part as Germany. Moreover, the reason why only Appendix 2 was in front of the Constitutional Court was that the complaint had been directed only against this appendix because only that appendix affected the rights of a certain land. Now, Germany had explained this as early as its response in the 51, sorry, 41.5 application in footnote 15, so more than three years ago. There are also other statements by, uh, in documents in the record which explain contemporaneous documents which explain that nobody expected a, a binding force. Now, Mr. Portugal, the head of the Business Division Energy Industry of Vattenfall Europe Nuclear Energy GmbH, stated in 2001 in an internal Vattenfall communication that changes to the atom consents were very probable, evidencing also the non-binding nature and the fact that Vattenfall did in fact understand this. Here on the screen you also see another uh, display of the decision of the Constitutional Court. Let me go to the charge that the measures were unreasonable or discriminatory, which uh, well I'm not quite sure how this differs from Vattenfall's charge that they were arbitrary, but let me again show you the slides which show the in number of incidents of Krümmel and Brunsbüttel in relation to all the plants that were shut down. That's slide 142. And in comparison to the plants that were allowed to keep running, in it's que clear that they did not belong in that group. The next slide shows all plants, this is 144, that were not allowed to operate after the 13th Amendment. And what you see is that per operator, two plants were shut down, two for RWE, two for ENBW, two for E.ON, and two for Vattenfall, with E.ON as a co-owner. <coughs> and obviously, the plants had no, the, the measures had no impact. There was no financial negative impact. I could end here because what I've described <coughs> before basically described that when enacting the 13th Amendment, the legislator devised a system to protect the financial interests of all stakeholders. They calculated on the bas a basis of the reference production volumes, which had been developed <coughs> jointly with the energy companies, which had also been taken as basis for the development fund agreement for the calculations, as a common calculatory basis. And on that basis, they determined a way to set the uh, fixed shutdown dates, which would enable all OEPVs to be consumed. But in our arbitration preparation, we went one step further. We actually had our financial experts look at reality. What happened after the 13th Amendment? What's the most recent information? And was the prognosis of the legislator borne out? This is the impact analysis. Let me be clear, the ECT does not require that. The ECT requires for a measure to be in line with fair and equitable uh, 
fair and equitable treatment and the protection against expropriation, that when you pass the law, you weigh the interest, you make a balanced decision that protects legitimate expectations. If later on, sky falls, something happens, in hindsight, the legislator may not have gotten it right. That doesn't make the law retroactively in breach. Because when you look at whether or not there's a breach of the ECT, you are examining the decision of the legislator. But again, we went one step further. We looked where they actually right, and it shows they were. Now, claimants overstate their alleged damages, and there are seven primary issues to discuss. They calculated a case but for Fukushima. They want you to assume that Germany is liable for the actions, um, not for the actions, but actually for the, um, for the nuclear disaster. And indeed, if you go to page 119, line 16 of the transcript, you would find Mr. Hub saying, quote, the only date, and he's referring to 11 March, quote, the only date at which valuation was uninfluenced by Shu Fukushima. This is in full compliance, uh, this is what is in full compliance with the ECT. So they basically betrayed their own case. They were trying to calculate a world but for Fukushima and not but for the measures. So put yourself in the shoes of somebody. Let's suppose we had a, fa a fair market value approach, which we don't because there's no expropriation. But would there have been an independent third party, a willing buyer, willing to buy a nuclear power plant the day after Fukushima? No. Would there have been a willing buyer for Vattenfall's plants after Fukushima? Plants, especially Krümmel, that had a history of incidents, of transformer fires, of bursting pipes, of corroding vessels, and of human and uh, organizational, uh, a human and hu uh, organizational framework that made it difficult even for E.ON as co-shareholder of Vattenfall to cope with it. Remember, the CEO of E.ON complained about Vattenfall's management of these plants. Now, if you were to buy this plant, you would buy it wholesale. The people running it, the management, in order to <coughs> take a broom and replace that run-in safety culture or lack thereof through a proper management, would you do that? Would you also buy the plants with all the bad uh, feelings attached to them because they are notorious for their failures? No, you would not. Now, also objectively and in the views of the energy companies, Fukushima was a game changer. This is an interview with Johannes Thaisen of E.ON in an interview um, with the German magazine Zeit on 7 January 2016. That's R223. <laughs> Question of the magazine. Yes, you fought to keep nuclear power for years. Would you have imagined 10 years ago that you'd ever become a green power manager? Answer, no, if anyone had said that to me, I would thought they were crazy. Question, how did you end up changing your mind? Answer, the management did a lot of traveling around the world in 2014 because we wanted to know whether the energy shift is nothing but pure speculation on the part of German politics or if something fundamental really has changed and must change in the energy sector. This is what we learned. In many countries, there's a lot of changes in opinion going on with people who use and produce energy. That is, that is what's causing a global energy shift. Eon's words, not mine. Claimants disregard the actual electricity prices 
and the developments in the market that are unrelated to the measures. Again, a quote from a Vattenfall annual report, this time the 2010. It says, Vattenfall must increase its profitability in value creation as well as reduce its debt. And later on, these are expected to lead to weaker price development compared to previous estimations. The recent year's recession has re resulted in weaker demand for electricity throughout Europe, which is reflected in lower electricity prices. It will take another several years before demand returns to 2008 levels. In long term, growth in Vattenfall's core markets is expected to be moderate. The addition of new generation capacity to the market in the years immediately ahead is also expected to put further pressure on electricity prices, 2010. You will recall this morning's discussion about the prices which Mr. Kazmarek took as of 10 March, one day before Fukushima, which were three, four days ahead of his valuation date of 14 March. And if, in case you were wondering what effect that had, you can refer to Ms. Harden's report, first report at 7.3.4. She says, if Navigant had applied the 11 March 2011 futures curve, its calculation of damages would have been approximately 134.21 million euro lower. So bearing in mind 10 March instead of 11 March electricity prices, 134 million. Now you will recall the a quote from Mr. Hupt, which I've just read, that he needed a, that claimants wanted electricity prices prior to Fukushima. Um, let's have a look. This document is an official document from the National Diet of Japan, R38. And the curve you see here is whether the people in villages surrounding the Fukushima plant knew about the incident. So. It starts with 0% and then eventually when they be were being evacuated, 100% of the people being evacuated, obviously knew about the accident in Fukushima. In the next slide, what we've done is put the dates of Mr. Kasmarek's valuation and the events of Fukushima as well as the closes of markets. We superimpose them over the graph. And what you see is the following. And these, these times are all in Japanese times. So we've adjusted the times for the closing of the European markets to Japan time, Tokyo time. So they're all in the same time zone. Now, the date that Mr. Kazmarek uses is, in, um, is the close of markets on 10 March, which in Japan was at 30 minutes past midnight on 11 March. The earthquake and the tsunami happened 15 hours later. The market closed on 11 March, so that is the difference between 10 March and 11 March for 134 million. That was at half past midnight, 030, on 12 March local time in Japan. By that time, this is the third red line that's going through between 5% and 15% of the population immediately adjacent of the to the plant only knew about the accident in Fukushima. So how could the markets in Germany know if the people living next door that would have you know, felt the immediate repercussions, quite literally, didn't know? The explosion in Unit 1, the one that was then noticed <coughs> internationally, was another 15 hours later. This shows you that the choosing of the 10 March prices as opposed to the 11 March prices, which, which were still unaffected by the events of Fukushima, was completely unreasonable, but made a difference for claimants of 134 million euro. The next slide you will see is the same chart 
depicted in a different way, and it's at uh, universal standard time, so Greenwich time. You have the same timeline, which may be easier to read for you. And indeed, Mr. Kazmarek admits that he and claimants ignore Fukushima and calculate a pre-Japan Japan case. Let's the footnote is a bit small on this slide, but we've blown it up for you on the next one. So he says in the footnote, this projection is also referred to internally within Vattenfall as the, quote, pre-Japan case because it reflects the price projection prepared prior to the nuclear moratorium that was announced shortly after the earthquake in Japan. Next slide. So not only does he calculate the pre-Japan case, but what is referred to internally in Vattenfall as the pre-Japan case, pre-Fukushima case, is what he defines as the pre-nuclear uh, pre moratorium price. Um, I would find that somewhat bold, if not misleading. Moreover, Mr. Kazmarek's electricity price, which you can see for 2012 is 53.20, is also higher, sorry, yeah, it's also higher than Vattenfall's pre-Japan case. Look at a comparison between NAF 242 and Mr. Kazmarek's Appendix R. For the same time period, you have a base ca uh, case in NAF 242, that's uh, Vattenfall's projection of 51.65 euro, and Mr. Kazmarek assumes 53.2, so higher than Vattenfall's own projections. First of all, what this demonstrates is the following. The diminution of energy prices following was a result of Fukushima and general economic factors, not of the measures. Indeed, the only impact that the measures would have had through the merit order is increase the energy prices. Because if you take a nuclear energy and renewables are the cheapest in the merit order. If you take out the production of eight plants from amongst the cheapest, you go to the right from your side to the more expensive ones. So if you expect an increase in energy, not a decrease. If there's a decrease, that is not by the measures. It has to have extraneous factors. And indeed, we're observing prices that plummeted, not just in Germany, but throughout Europe. Indeed, the gap between Mr. Kazmarek's actual and but for, he assumes the same price, although you would expect actual to be higher than but for, is somewhere in the range of 50 euros, far, far, far above what was actually observed in the markets, which shows how unreliable that is. If you use reliable information, including projection devices that energy companies, such as Vattenfall, use to make long-term million and billion heavy investments. These models, Amp Aurora for example, they give you a better picture for price projections and they show that the actual case, meaning with the 13th Amendment, resulted in higher electricity prices than but for the measures. Let's come to another very striking and important event. Button claimants misrepresent the issues relating to the restart of Crummel and Brunsbüttel. Let me show you again the slide with the operating history. <coughs> For four years before Fukushima, Vattenfall had de facto been completely standing, apart from a very short period that was then ended with a short circuit in transformer number two and an incorrectly closed valve, so in July 2009. Vattenfall showed you this morning an email from Mr. von Ratschek on slide 49, that's C200. 
And this email concerns the technical readiness of the plant. And if you've listened to my opening about the interplay of human organizational and technological effects in running a power plant, you have taken away the message that technology is only one factor and perhaps the least problematic of the three. Chernobyl happened because of human error. Fukushima, if you look at it, the design that was applied was a human design. And they didn't take into account that there could be a tsunami of that amount. So that is the human factor. And actually, if you read the report of what caused the Chernobyl incident, and I compared it to the report of the transformer fire and the failing pump in, in Kurmil, it's not so dissimilar. Luckily, nothing happened. Luckily, this was an incident, not an accident. But that shows you how important the human factor is, but also the organizational factor, which is a new takeaway that was taken away after the experience with other plants. It's not just the human, but the organization that shapes the human. It's interrelated. And in order to be able to restart, you have to have everything. And the reliability proceedings were not completed until July 2013. That was not respondents' fault. Vattenfall had to cooperate in these proceedings. And the last necessary expert report was only issued on 12 June 2013. So assuming a decision within two weeks, that's not an excessive length um, for making such a decision. And obviously, Vattenfall did not make an application. Well, they said it doesn't make sense to make an application if you're shut down. Vattenfall has done so much, including delaying of applying for the license to decommission, which was with this arbitration and with the legal disputes in mind. If you have legal disputes in mind, then of course you file an application for a restart, because then you trigger that it's denied and then you go to the courts and fight it. Well, I'm sure they would have uh, made an application for a restart if they had been ready. And moreover, as you know, this um, all happened after the long saga, Vattenfall trying in vain to find a new uh, technical uh, manager for the plant. Indeed, and I've given you flavor, but Mr. Klosters, who is here tomorrow, will be able to tell you more fulsomely what really happened and what was his experience as a, a supervisory authority. The approach by Vattenfall to be untransparent, to be deceptive, um, to withhold information. Um, that informed the regulator. They failed to advise the supervisory <coughs> authority of the short circuits in the second transformer, failed to advise about the metal pieces and the reactor pressure vessel. That is something that's not undangerous. They, fa they failed to perform a technical discharge test on the reform, on, on the transformer which had been a prerequisite for a restart, but they didn't do it. And then the transformer failed a second time. And that was actually the one that they had failed to test before they restarted or during the restart. Obviously, the supervisory authority was concerned and wanted to look into it. And indeed, they were writing to Vattenfall on 21 September 2009, <coughs> and you have a blow up from that here. And they say, regardless of this current state of affairs, I would like to obtain clarity regarding the proceedings for an early stage, at an, uh, proceedings at an early stage, and therefore kindly ask you to issue a clarifying statement that you share my opinion regarding the condition of prior approval and that you will refrain from restarting the nuclear power plant Krummel without the prior approval of the Nuclear Supervisory Authority. Please respond by 5 October 2009. Exhibit Goetzinger 27. Vattenfall's answer came not by 5 October 2009. Indeed, it didn't come until 15 November 2010. Goetzinger 28, Vattenfall answers. 
we have already informed you repeatedly that the nuclear power plant will only be restarted with the consent of the nuclear supervisory authority. Nothing about this decision has changed to date. And then they continue. As there has been no exchange of fuel, nuclear fuel off the plant during the current shutdown, we are of the opinion that the content-related restrictions under the second operation license do not apply. From our point of view, however, the scope and significance of the activities carried out during the shutdown justify the same procedural course of action that is taking after the annual exchange of nuclear fuel. So Vattenfall says, we don't really agree with your legal reasoning, but we give you the same promise. We waive our right to restart without prior approval. Now, when I was listening to the video that Vattenfall put on screen this morning, actually something occurred to me. You, re you, you see the words annual exchange of nuclear fuel underlined in this letter. And in the video it says, during the annual revision, during which a sixth of the elements is exchanged. So, ordinary course of business. Once a year, there's a revision during which fuel elements are exchanged. And then before a restart, under the condition, approval is necessary. So the license and the ordinary operation of the plant require supervisory approval once a year. Now, because Krummel had been standing since 2007 and had been shut down, as you know, in 2009, it came up, restarted, and crashed down again. The fuel in the rods wasn't used up so there was no exchange because it was fresh. The reason why there was no annual exchange and therefore no annual requirement for, um, at least if you just look at the fuel, of supervisory authority giving or withholding an approval, that annual rhythm was broken because Vattenfall had not been running the plant because it was down and it, was, it went down for the second time in 2009 with fresh fuel. So basically, instead of having an annual approval process with the ordinary exchange of fuel, since 2009, there hadn't been such an approval process because the plant had been standing with fresh fuel, so to speak. But let's look at, apart from this, whether it's really true what Wattenfeld says that there was no exchange of fuel elements. Let's look at the operating license. It says after changes of fuel elements. It doesn't say the fuel elements. It doesn't say all fuel elements. And you've seen in the video, one sixth is normally a exchange, not you know everything. And our experts looked at what really happened. And I commend the export report by Mr. Grotzinger. He says, these are quotes from 78, 79, 82, and 85 of his, of his report. A single fuel element was found to be defective. This defective fuel element was removed from the reactor pressure vessel and replaced. <coughs> In addition, on a total of three additional fuel elements, fuel rods were replaced as a precautionary measure. Further, new fuel element feet with foreign particle filters, debris filters, were installed on almost half of the fuel elements, and modifications were made to the respective fuel element channels. In opening the reactor pressure vessel, removing a fuel element from the reactor pressure vessel, and the subsequent necessary installation of a fuel element and final reclosing of the reactor pressure vessel, this means the situation of an exchange of fuel elements is clearly met. The situation exchange of fuel elements arising from the valid operating license was indisputably <laughs> met here, and the approval of the supervisory authority to restart this nuclear power plant had to be obtained, expert report by Mr. Grötzinger, and confirmed by the second opinion by Professor Eber, paragraph 33. Fuel rods were exchanged in three fuel elements. Fuel rods were removed from fur four further fuel elements and replaced by dummy rods. Debris filters designed to prevent the entry of foreign objects into the fuel elements were added to 347 fuel elements. 
So there was an exchange of fuel elements and uh, approval was required. And also claimants had filed such applications in the past, as is clear from Grotzinger Exhibit 16 and BB1. In any event, even if not required, which it was, claimants waived the right in the letter and they agreed to not be restarting unless approved. Again, confirmed by Professor Eva's report at paragraph 95. Claimants, <coughs> legal experts, are trying to plead away that letter in which Vattenfall clearly agreed. The Arndt report says in paragraph se uh, 37, the letter had no legal significance because it allegedly constitutes a unilateral voluntary self-commitment vis-a-vis the supervisory authority. Uh, it's legally uh, ineffective under German law uh, unless expressly provided by statutory law. Well, claimants do not deny that they agreed not to restart Krummel without proper consent of the supervisory authority. They do not have been deny that the proceedings were still pending as of June 2013. And they don't even allege that they ever complained, neither in their 15 November 2010 letter nor otherwise. They were never complaining that the supervisory authority was acting ultra virus. They were never seeking legal remedies against it. And You've seen from the, uh, some of the legal authorities um, introduced with claimants' legal opinions that there's quite a number of them that relate to legal proceedings to this very plan. So they are normally very litigious. The expert report Vattenfall supplied, Professor Arndt doesn't even address restriction 3.2. He was informed that no exchange conducted of fuel elements, but it happened. So all the expert report is, is really superfluous because he wasn't operating on the right factual basis. He answered questions that aren't even relevant because the authority had the right to give an approval. It's an academic exercise. When reliability was finally confirmed, that was under the post 13th Amendment conditions. And that's exhibit 187, page two, and it says, thus the context for the assessment of reliability under the Atomic Energy Act had changed. Well, even assume if Professor Arndt was right that there was an indivisible reliability, what would have been the result? The authority said reliable, considering this is not a hot plant, there's no pressure in it, it's not running. Um, for that, that's less demanding. I think under these circumstances, you're reliable. Had they had to consider it with a hot plant running under pressure, they wouldn't have confirmed the reliability at that time. At least Vattenfall would have the burden of proof for that it is quite likely it would have taken much longer and further examinations would have taken place. This is evidenced both by exhibit R187, but you can also obviously ask uh, Mr. Klosters tomorrow. A restart before July 2013 would not have been possible. In the Grotzinger report at paragraph 210, as I illustrated in detail in my report, the Krummel nuclear power plant could only have been restarted on 1st of July 2013 at the very earliest. Kloster's witness statement, paragraph 40 to 43. The enactment of the 13th Amendment meant that the, quote, supervisory authority needed only to evaluate whether the operator was sufficiently reliable to perform the post-operational phase as well as later decommissioning activities and not whether it was reliable for the purposes of operating. This is a very different legal standard than the one that must be considered for purposes of continued operations, and it would have taken substantially longer to certify the operator for full operations, end of quote. From the same sources, you will also find statements about the shockingly lacking safety culture of Vattenfall. Closest witness statement, paragraph 18, 
quote, a profound lack of safety culture related to the operation of a nuclear power plant, end of quote. Quote, alarming that the operator did not take the necessary measures to help prevent another incident with a transformer, end of quote. Or the Grötzinger report, paragraph 119. Quote, quality assurance and quality management within the Kurmel nuclear power plant had significant deficiencies, a key organizational element to ensure the safe condition and operation of the plant in accordance with the license is the systematic, complete, and timely pursuit and execution of safety-related obligations and requirements. There was no meaningful reply from claimants, if you look at their expert reports. They, and also this morning, claimed there were no issues with the management and the incidents were without implications for the reliability or with Vattenfall's ability to operate the plant. The next big problem, they incorrectly assume the NEPVs. We've talked about that earlier. Next point, they incorrectly calculate the value of the OEPVs. Respondent demonstrated that the OEPVs have a value, a quite significant value. And one issue in that context is the utilization of plants. Respondent and its experts also showed why the res uh, reference production volumes are the only reasonable me method, the only neutral method to es estimate utilization, and that this method was accepted at the time of the measures. And you are seeing Ms. Hardin's uh, slide, her table 29, which attributes about a billion euro in value. And we've talked about the demand in Bokdorf to keep it running from 2019 to 2021. Indeed, she did a sensitivity analysis in her table 16 in her second report and calculated the OEPVs in claimant's OEPV only scenario. And the same value resulted. The reference production volumes are not credibly disputed by Mr. Kazmarek. Still, again, we've been thorough. We, Ms. we asked Ms. Harden to perform a sensitivity analysis on the basis of averages. She chose a five-year historic average. But before we come to that, let's look quickly at the development fund agreement, which used also as a basis the reference production volumes for calculation purposes. Moreover, if you look um, at the next slide, you remember that um, Mr. Kazmarek has issues with the reference production volumes, but he assigns to Krummel a utilization um, quota for the future that exceeds reference production volumes. 85%. So apparently for Krummel in his but for, higher than reference production volumes is fine. But if respondent uses reference production volumes, that's of course off the line and unrealistic. Well, if you look at the historic utilization of Krummel, um, that one that he juxtaposes with 85%, what he thinks it can achieve in the future, 77% because of the long standstill, because of the failures, because of the problems with the plant. So um, this is figure 11 from Ms. Harden's second report um, that's forecasting the utilization on the basis of historical averages and that is the calculation that results from it. What you will see is that the result for claimants is still the same. There is no negative financial impact for their interest in the three plants. <coughs> yes, there is a little impact for Brunsbüttel in that scenario. But let me explain you why. You remember there was a dispute between the parties who would buy the OEPVs. And we said first, well, first Brunsbüttel will be eaten up, then Krümmel. Mr. Kasmarek says, no, no, first, E.ON will take over the parts from Kummel because it has 50% instead of just a third interest in these OEPVs. So Ms. Harden calculated it, saying first Kummel's OEPVs will be eaten up and then Brunsbüttel's. This is why there's a little um, 
impact visible here on Brunsbüttel. Only for that plant, not if you look at the entirety of the three plants. So still, even on the five-year average, and even assuming this way of allocating the OEPVs in response to Mr. Kazmarek's criticism, the end result is there's no negative financial impact. I will hopefully spare you a lot of math, but I will still show you at least visually some of um, uh, claimants' um, attachments. You will remember that our experts, especially Mr. Grauf, criticized Vattenfall's projections of OPEX, of operating costs. They said, well, you know, he didn't understand it. We made just minor corrections and delivered NAV 105A for OPEX. Yellow is what they changed. So the ma minor corrections are basically almost everything on that page. And obviously, this, these are 30 pages and more documents. We've just given you a screenshot because I'm sure you will be grateful I'm not taking you through Excel uh, slides. The same result and the same image for CAPEX, the capital expenditures. They were, these adjustments were required because of errors that claimants experts made. But still, even with these errors corrected, there were 500 million of CAPEX costs missing the additional uh, projects that would have been required had Krummel been allowed to operate after Fukushima. Professor Hobea said at transcript 33, line 11, that claimants accept that more stringent safety rules could have been expected. Well, those would be the costs for such more stringent safety rules, and they would have had to be included in Vattenfall's but for calculation, but half a billion was missing. And I'm reaching the last point of the seven big issues. Also, their decommissioning uh, estimates make no sense, mm. and they inflate artificially the duration and the cost. Let's talk about applications they make or don't make um, in the context of improving their, their idea of improving their chances in the arbitration or the constitutional court proceedings. You will see that all other plants that lost their license to operate, produce power after 11th Amendment filed their application for decommissioning either in 2012 or in one case, in, sorry, in two cases in 2013. Vattenfall did not file an application for decommissioning until 24 August 2015, over three years later. And moreover, if you look at that application, unfortunately that is just in the German, so I will read it into the record in German and translate it myself. Wir behalten uns des Weiteren ausdrücklich vor, diesen Antrag zurückzuziehen bzw. eine erteilte Genehmigung nicht auszunutzen. So, we reserve the right explicitly to withdraw this application or not to make use of a granted permit, meaning they could withdraw their decommissioning application immediately so they can power up the plant. So this is clearly, again, a statement which is made more with an eye on the constitutional court proceedings and the arbitration than in complying with the nuclear phase-out. Um, yes, I, I will spare the comment. Um, also, the length and the duration of the decommissioning period in that what Vattenfall proposes, and you have Mr. Seiler here next week, you can ask him, is much longer than anybody else's. It's not reasonable. The same appears when you look at the amounts. If you look at the figures that are you know, visible from practice, there's an average cost of 820 million for boiling water reactors such as Krümmel. 
and 720 for pressurized water reactors. And those are estimates which are then validated by Mr. Cordes, who is the CEO of EWN, a specialist company for dish commissioning. So let's take 820 as figure in our head and look at the next slide. Vattenfall is proposing a cost of 1.4 billion for Krumme. Now 800,000 is 800,000 is in the middle of the blue field. There was one plant with particular issues, especially management issues, which is Wurgassen. That is the one that was roughly a billion. Vattenfall is not even staying within the blue zone, but it wouldn't e it would be completely off the chart with their projection for Krummel. They are planning on ha using 40% more, more than anybody else in Germany plans to spend on decommissioning. <coughs> well, that could mean a number of things. First, there could be things, problems with the plant that they haven't yet disclosed to the supervisory authority. Um, in which case, say, leakage or radiation, more radiation that they have to clean up, which obviously um, negatively affects the value of the plants. Um, or they want to make Germany pay for their own inefficiency. In both cases, this is not something that's recoverable through arbitration. The first Seiler report uh, explains that there's no reasonable basis to inflate the costs by 40%. And his account of the costs, and you can see that in the two Seiler reports, is thorough and it's scientific, and you will see it's also more convincing. And his assessment was comp uh, com underlined by Mr. Cordes, who's actually doing the decommissioning in certain plants. Whereas Mr. Charles, Mr. Huckel, Professor Tomowski, and Mr. Kazmarek did not perform an independent calculation and simply accepted Vattenfall's estimates and the NIS review of that estimate. Again, NIS did also not do an independent inquiry. They used Vattenfall's est uh, estimate and just validated it. The result of that is, and I'm putting on a quote from the Hardin report, that there was no negative financial impact on Vattenfall. Nothing. And therefore, claimant's case must fail. There's no jurisdiction on the 1.8 billion plus interest claim for the financial interest and on for the financial benefit of E.ON. There's no jurisdiction for claimant's claims on the basis of the nuclear tax, fuel tax law, a tax law excluded from the scope of the ECT <coughs> under Article 21. There's no breach of the Energy Charter Treaties Part 3 as a result of the measures. And there's no financial impact on claimants by the measures. Therefore, there can be no damage, no case to answer, and Vattenfall's claims should be denied with costs. Thank you very much. Thank you. That completes uh, respondents' uh, opening statement. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we can close them for today. And we see each other tomorrow at uh, 9 o'clock.